Happy Friday afternoon. My name is Jim Bachman. I'm with the Brewers Association of Maryland. I'd like to thank you for tuning in for this installment of our uh, Fermented Friday chat. We're going to be joined by Jake Blackman at Smoketown Brewing. Really cool conversation this afternoon about a brewery with two unique locations uh, in Frederick County, Maryland, uh, both uh, producing great beer and great locations for you to go and visit uh, when you're out doing your tours of Maryland beer. Uh, before we jump into the conversation with Jake, I just want to remind everybody that Maryland's breweries are open for business. They would welcome your support in any way that you can show it to them. Many of our breweries are open for delivery, carry out, curbside pickup. You can even go and drink beer in tasting rooms and on properties at breweries throughout the state. So check with your favorite local brewery, find out what they're doing to keep you safe during this time, and uh, celebrate with some Maryland beer. I would also like to say that if you have any questions or comments for myself or Jake during this conversation, throw them into the comments section, either on YouTube or Facebook. We'll answer them. We'll show them on the screen. Uh, we like to do this for you and would like to have you involved. So thank you very much for those who ask questions weekly, and uh, we look forward to our chat. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my buddy, Jake. Jake, how you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm good, Jim. How are you? I'm doing well. So uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon, man. It's beautiful here in Frederick. I know we're only like eight blocks away from each other. I feel like we're so far. Great. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful Friday here. Yeah, it couldn't be better. Um, so before we jump into everything, tell us who you are and what's going on at uh, at Smoketown Brewing. Where, where you guys yeah. come from? Um, so my name is Jake. Um, I'm the director of operations uh, for Smoketown Brewing. That's a fancy title. That means I do a little bit of everything um, from, you know, logistics to the sales stuff to, to the tap room stuff. Um, so I'm kind of a jack of all trades here, do whatever needs to be done. Um, but yeah, so uh, I'm I'm right here at uh, Smoketown Creekside. This is our, uh, our second location. Um, our first location is uh, in Brunswick in the old fire hall. Um, and really that that is the story of how we began and, and this, the story of Smoketown really um, is our Brunswick location. Um, should I go ahead and, and talk about that, Jim? Story of our... Uh, yeah, um, please do. Yeah, so in 2014, uh, my dad, David, he purchased the old uh, Brunswick Fire Hall. Uh, and at that moment, it was just a big, empty, you know, beautiful space, a lot of history. Uh, but at, at that point in time, his idea was to kind of open an architectural salvage um, instead of, you know, uh, if you wanted to, to buy a 50 year old door for your 50 year old home, you could do it there instead of going to Home Depot and buying everything brand new. So originally that was the plan. Um, and then a buddy of his actually sent him an article about a brewery in Colorado that had just opened in a fire hall. Um, and I remember I was in college back then in 2014 and I came home one day from college and, and my dad said, Hey, uh, what do you think about doing a brewery instead? And I was like, uh, hell yeah, that's amazing. That's way I like that way better. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, and so ever since then, we kind of switched gears and 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 went the brewery route. Um, and you know, we were uniquely challenged because we love beer and we love craft beer, but we didn't know the first thing about uh about where to start and how to do it. Um, so yeah, we uh we opened up in uh, 2015 in Brunswick. Um, so. This this coming March will be our, our five year anniversary there, um, as well as our second location. Um, actually, later this week we'll celebrate our, our one year anniversary in Frederick. That's great. Sorry, I'm a little distracted because I'm setting myself up for the beer that we're going to be drinking in Perfect. a few minutes. <laughs> um, I think it's really cool that the uh, the idea just kind of came through almost like a an epiphany of a moment through yeah. an interaction with a friend. Like that's really neat. Um, the location in Brunswick is really, really a fascinating place. You guys have done a lot there to keep the style and tradition of the building uh, while right. making a home for a really great brewery and a great meeting space for the people in the community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, so that was, that, that was a huge thing for us in Brunswick um, is, is the, the history and, and uh, just the beauty of the building itself we really wanted to, to showcase and highlight when we opened up the brewery there so um we, we kept a lot of the original stuff the original flooring which you can actually really see company number five which is the uh the volunteer fire department um building number 
Um, and all the stuff is actually uh, that we decorate is with refurbished or uh, repurposed material and stuff. So like the doors to our brew house come off a, um, you know, 200 year old barn in, in the, uh, the farm area around us and, and stuff like that. So um, and then, of course, upstairs used to be it hosted quite a few uh, amazing acts, um, especially during the, uh, the heyday of, of the town of Brunswick. Um, you know, acts like Patsy Cline, um, Jimmy Dean, uh, Duke Ellington, Bob Seeger, all, all, of, all of them have played upstairs in, in our event space when it was the, uh, the volunteer fire department. It's very cool that there's that much heritage right there uh, in Brunswick. I mean, for a lot of folks who even live in Frederick County, Brunswick is kind of like the place you pass if you're going to Northern Virginia or to other places in Southern Frederick County. But when you really stop there and take it all in, it's a really quaint place. And it's a great destination for a brewery like yours. Um, and you talk about the refurbished materials. If I recall, the refurbished materials have followed your your move all the way to Creekside as well, right? <laughs> yes, actually, um, both both locations. Even though they each, we, we try to give them um, each a unique feel and a unique um, aesthetic, but one that worked with each other. And and the easiest way to do that was to use the same refurbished, repurposed stuff. So you'll notice both places, uh, the bar is made out of an old bowling alley. Um, you know, all of the, uh, the decorations here at Creekside, we use uh, old barrels that we took apart to, to decorate the walls. And we actually made uh, lights out of the barrel rings, um, you know, stuff like that. Well, it's a really nice eye. And uh, I, I really enjoyed coming to your grand opening last year uh, for your ribbon yeah. cutting and seeing- yeah, Almost you know, a year ago. The bowling alley table top. It's like, you know, you sit there and there's this sense of familiarity with something and you're looking at it and it, it dawns on you. And you're like, oh, what a great use for this product or that product. Um, right. Yeah. Oh, I got to I gotta give, uh, I gotta give my dad credit. I, he's got an eye like nobody I've ever met. Uh, you know, he sees something which to me, I'm like, that looks like a piece of trash or junk. And he's like, I can I can make this work. I can make this into something beautiful. And he always uh, he always does. So our friend Christian from Frank About Beer has a ton of stuff for us to talk about. And I'm glad he's on this wavelength because he and I are like, awesome. he's hitting on all the things that I already have lined up for later. Christian, I'm going to pop all your questions up. Don't worry about it, man. We're set to rock and roll. Um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you talk kind of about what the, what the ambition was for the Creekside location and kind of how they're set aside in your company's overall business model between the two locations? Yeah, so um, we were we're in a unique challenge um, that when we decided that we wanted to do a second location was right around the time that the state of Maryland was letting uh, individuals own more than one liquor license, um, and so really we were we were one of very few starting this this new uh, kind of business model. So um, we are we are uniquely challenged because we didn't have a whole lot of uh normally we go to other band members and say hey what do we do about this how'd you guys do it um but we were we were one of the first ones um so that was one of the biggest challenges um but so really what happened was um starting in brunswick a lot of our our business model and our five-year plan uh was actually developed around the space upstairs the event space um and after running into a few uh, um, hurdles with that, uh, mostly to do with, you know, uh, trying to convert a, a 70 year old uh, event space into something more modernized and something that we could use for our events and stuff, uh, we definitely ran into some un unforeseen hurdles. Um, and that was part of our five year plan was to open that place up so that the event space would, would be its own kind of tourism draw. Uh, so going on year four, three or four, when we found out that this was going to take a lot longer than we had hoped to open the event space, um, you know, we had a lot of folks that would come into to Smoketown and they would say, I love you guys' beer. I love your place. You know, but we just wish that you were closer. Right. And of, of course, it's a very uh, classic, like Frederick mindset. A lot of my friends live downtown and say Brunswick's too far away, but they'll drive 20 minutes to the other side of Frederick. But either way, we knew we had a we, we knew that most of our, our base was in Frederick City and, and Frederick City is is really unbeatable when it comes to its beer scene, uh, being the unofficial brewery capital of Maryland. So 
um, we really set our sights uh, on on downtown Frederick, um, and we got really lucky with the space when it the way it timed out. Um, and so yeah, we, we we really just pivoted. We knew that we we're gonna have to put a pause on the event space upstairs, but we wanted another space. We wanted to be closer to, to people in Frederick. We wanted to expand our brand, um, and so it really was a no-brainer to to move here. And where you guys are located is very fortuitous in yes. terms of, you know, kind of being a great place for a craft brewery to be on the crate. Yeah, you, you, you cannot beat it. Access, you have this anchor now that you've got there between you, Attaboy, Idiom, Steinhardt. I mean, it's it's a real true destination for craft beer fans who are coming to Frederick to experience what's going on. And they have this little, like, corner of the city that's carved out for them to experience great beer. Yeah, no, I always, I always tell people, you know, Frederick's always been a great place to, to, for beer tourism, but you really can't beat the fact that you can park in one parking lot and visit four breweries without ever uh, getting back in your car. That's, that's absolutely true. I also wanted to say that uh, I can attest to the fact that the idea for that upstairs space at the fire, uh, firehouse to be a, an, an event space uh, <laughs> goes all the way back to the beginning because I think I came in two or three weeks after – uh, you guys opened and your dad gave my wife and I a tour and he's like, and up here are all these great acts played and we're going to have great events here. And I'm, you know, sitting here going, Oh my gosh, I can't wait for like live music venue to be somewhere in Frederick County. And right. you know, it's kind of, it's happening. <laughs> At the it is happening <laughs> slow. Uh, we are, we're, we're definitely bright eyed and, and, um, and really optimistic at the very beginning before you realize, you know, all of the hurdles of, and bureaucracy of, of the world. But um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's definitely been the plan since day one and it's still on the plan and we are closer than ever uh, to, to opening that. And it re we really are hoping, obviously with, with, with COVID hitting, um, it, that, that was the biggest uh, challenge that we've hit in, in our, um, our opening date. But um, we, we are back on track and uh, we're really excited about opening for 2021. So for any of you that are watching and, you know, you may know the Brewers Association through the work that we do to put on events every year that people love to attend both in Frederick and in Baltimore. And we have the uh, February event that we do down in Silver Spring. Um, one of the big things that the Brewers Association handles is things like legislation on the local county state level. Uh, we, we work with our national counterparts for federal legislation. Uh, we do things on behalf of the industry to try to make things easier. And because this industry is new and it's growing so fast and there are new ideas coming all the time, places like Smoketown that have an idea to convert uh, a building or bring a building back to what it used to be through entertainment and new access for consumers, sometimes out of what the expectations may have been from the local uh, zoning board, leadership, whatever you're talking to or whomever you're talking to. And uh, one of the things that we try to do is pull all of these people onto the same sheet of music so that we can uh, make it work. So we're hopeful that changes are going to come in Frederick County that are going to make life a little easier for Smoketown to get what they can. Yes. Yes. And a huge thank you to, to BAM for all of the help, especially with legislation, because that's one of those things where, uh, you know, you, you, you start a brewery. Uh, you work for a brewery, you don't realize how much politics uh, you'll have to have to play. So always thank you to BAM for helping with that. Well, and BAM owes you guys a huge thank you. At the beginning of this whole kerfuffle and crisis with COVID, you were one of the first breweries in the state to jump forward with a uh, funding idea for the Brewers Association. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you guys did with your Heffy Weizen and uh, how that beer is selling for, has sold for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... The, our Hefeweizen and our German Crossing, um, that's one of our core beers. Um, that's one of the ones I, I bring to almost every festival we have. So if you've had, if you've been to our tent, you've probably tried it. Um, so yeah, it's it's always been that was I think our our third can that we ever created um, in in uh, six packs, and um, we were really excited about a, a new opportunity um, this summer. Uh, to, to put some of these, the, the uh, Hefeweizen into 16 ounce cans uh, for a few festivals. Um, but obviously come March, we start realizing that, uh, you know, May and June festivals, the, the closer you get, you're like, there's no way that this is happening. Um, and so, you know, while we were taking it step by step, trying to figure out what's our plan, how's this going to affect us, you know, what's this going to do for us? Um, one of our thoughts was, was really like, oh, 
oh crap, uh, what is BAM going to do too? Because, you know, the Maryland Craft Beer Festival, as well as your your other beer festivals, are, are a huge fundraising opportunity for BAM. So that was when we were immediately like, hey, we have a bunch of beer. Let's put it to good use and uh, and, and do the right thing and try to raise some money for BAM. And, um, you know. Try to try to do what they always do for us and give give out a helping hand. So. Well, on behalf of your association and all the other members, we'd like to thank you for that effort. And it's uh, it's good. turned out to be a great thing. We've had other members uh, go out and come up with fundraising options on their own. Idiom came out with their idea to do the Brew for Bam collaboration that they kind of uh, got the industry engaged with. We had True Respite do something with their This is What Maryland Does release. So uh, you know, thank you all for your contribution and you're you're willing yeah, no, I, to go out on a limb for your association i love it and that's that's what part of uh being a, being a member of bam is all about very cool well we would be remiss if we're talking about two great brewery locations without talking about beer so do you want to start us off with a couple of uh a couple of chats about some beers you've got a great lineup today i'm very fortunate yeah, so, yeah yeah you you hooked me up with a with a sample of each of these so i'm, I'm looking forward to chatting about them yeah, these are these are some of our uh, our newest and more you know exciting uh, releases. Um, I chose a few of uh, of our beers that we don't normally take to festivals. So anyone that is watching, uh, you know, these are kind of our staples, but that you have to come in and visit us to really uh, to get a taste of. Um, so the the very first one it is one of our uh, new releases for the summer. Um, it's our R and R. Uh, which stands for raspberry rhubarb slash railroad as well. Um, and uh, it's a raspberry rhubarb uh, tart pale. Um, so that's actually what I have uh, in my glass right now. Um, it's delicious. Um, you know, it's got all the nice summery, uh, you know, flavors of, of the raspberry rhubarb. Um, but the fact that it's a tart ale opposed to a sour really makes it extra crushable um it's very refreshing um and honestly like sometimes after a long day's work i actually just drink this because i'm thirsty you know <laughs> um so this is uh one of my new favorites uh, the r and r uh art. you're not supposed to talk about how thirst quenching beer is but it really does work to uh, quench the thirst every once in a while doesn't it it really does yes so uh, let's talk a little bit about your fruit additions and how the beer is made. Where are you guys adding this fruit? Is this start out as a kettle sour? It does, yeah, actually. So uh, we make it just like a kettle sour. Um, that's where uh, the fruit additions also happen. Um, and yeah, it's, it's actually a fairly uh, easy beer to make. And, and kettle sours are something that we had just started um, doing here. Uh, because we had we'd done a few uh, sours before in, in Brunswick, but really most of our sours there were all barrel-aged sours. Um, and as you're aware, that's it's a lot of work and a lot of time. Really, it's, it's just a time waiting. And um, so that's why I really, uh, after the start of this summer, uh, we really started looking into to doing some kettle sours, uh, a slightly less time-consuming, uh, equally as refreshing way to uh to get some some tart and sour beers out there on our lineup i think the kettle sour is also uh very it's almost ubiquitous now people are used to seeing it almost everywhere they go uh because the style is so um welcoming i mean it's it's appealing it's something that people can approach easily uh and right. the refreshing characteristic of that nice acidic finish is just something that i think is pleasant to just about everybody yeah, it's, I think it's a very familiar flavor, whether it's, you know, juice, lemonade, whatever. And actually, one of one of our new new kettle sours um, is called the Midway Maiden. It's our strawberry lemonade kettle sour. And really, it needs no explanation because the name does its job. It, it tastes just like the strawberry lemonade you get at the Frederick Fair. Are you guys using um, fresh local fruit in your in your sour program are you using pureed stuff what what is where are you leaning and what's working out for you so uh we do a little bit of both a lot of our stuff comes from uh puree um just because you know it's just bulk we need we need to have that volume and and some of the the local fresh stuff is isn't as scalable um but we try to do a little bit of mix especially with everything going on trying to support some local farms and, and local 
things around us. Yeah. That's good stuff. Uh, we were having a conversation about kind of kettle soured stuff and additions last week when I had uh, Mike on from Sapwood Cellars. And one of the big things that he pointed out is the guy who wrote the book on American sour beer. Um, he was right. talking about the, the great access to aseptically packed fruit and how it makes the brewing process so much more sanitary and, yeah. and easy to do. Uh, when you're trying to achieve a high quality product with a reproducible flavor. Right, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, we, we're definitely lucky to live in a time uh, where where science supports stuff like that, where you don't have to worry about random infections and, and unintentional flavors. Um, and like you said, one of the one of the biggest things, especially that's overlooked when you're making beer, um, is is the ability to replicate it. Um, and so, like you said, you know, we want this R and R part to be the same every time you have it um and that that plays a big part in that can you uh no i thought i had a good question it just totally like left my head man where did it go yeah. <laughs> it'll come back to me i promise yeah, um, cool. yeah if you'd like to move on or if you want to keep talking about r and r oh i was going to ask about package formats how is it available for your consumer yeah, so right now it's available in Growler and Crowler, and then obviously on tap. Cool. Yeah, so um, with that, uh, I guess we'll move on to the, uh, the next one. Um, so the next is our uh, Patsy Hazy IPA. So this one I had to pick, obviously, because this is, this is our best-selling beer. Um, it's become our most popular um, and yeah, you can't beat the can. It has one of the coolest cans in the game, I must say. Um, our graphic designer really hit the hit it out of the park with this. So it, it's actually modeled after an old uh, old style um, Patsy Klein concert poster that we actually found that said like it was for her performance at, at the fire station. Um, it's a very 19, uh, you know, 50s, 60s uh, style to do that, that pink, yellow, and green. Um, and then also on the can is is the uh, the actual music for Walking After Midnight. So, I was going to ask what the sheet music was, so I'm glad you put that yeah. in. Yep, it's, it's Walking After Midnight. So, yeah. So we originally actually came out with the Patsy for our third year anniversary, our, our hoot nanny, as we call it, which is our big year, end of the year celebration. Um, and that was that was actually the first big hoot nanny where we we closed the streets down. We're like, we're gonna make this a party that everyone wants to come to. Um, so that was right around when hazy IPAs started to to blow up in their uh, popularity. So of course, Greg said, "Let me let me uh, try a stab at this." Um, and yeah. the Patsy IPA, Hazy IPA, is actually our very first Hazy. So the very first recipe, we sold out of it that day at at our Hoot Nanny, um, and it's been one of our staples ever since. I think you may have been one of the first Frederick County breweries with a Hazy that became a staple. Um, yeah. yeah. When you released that, and uh, that kind of goes back to one of the questions that Christian had. Now that we're two beers deep in this conversation and kind of talking a little bit, what was yeah. the uh, first beer that Smoketown released? And is it something that you guys are still putting out there? Yeah, so actually, um, I just found a picture on my phone from our very first opening night. So um, I believe that the first beer that we ever made was our Berlin Brown Ale, which we do have. We, we, that's one of our core beers still. Um, our, our opening night, I believe we had, um, we had what we called our inaugural IPA, which that is something that we've never made before. And we never made again. It was just, you know, one of our quick recipes, we need an IPA on tap. Um, and then the Berlin Brown Ale, the, uh, German Crossing, our Hepfeitzen, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and then I believe we had our very first stout recipe. Um, which we didn't really like. It wasn't uh, full enough for, for us, so we, we, we ended up uh, trying a new recipe, and, and that stout is now our, uh, our core stout. And I think that's it. So it's kind of funny because now we have 24 beers on tap, uh, everything on the spectrum from light to dark, from malty to hoppy, and, um, and you know, humble, very humble beginnings starting off with, with five for opening night. 
Well, and the shape of the uh, industry has changed quite a bit, even in the last five, six years. You know, you're talking about something where it was almost uh, expected that you would see six or seven beers at most breweries. And now right. the expectation is like, oh, I better see a dozen. And if I don't, it's not somewhere where I want to spend my time. So the consumer's right. demand has changed quite a bit. Yeah, well, so I think I think that has to do, and, and just that business model for us has to do a lot about um, us opening in Brunswick. Uh, we were the we were the first and only brewery there. Um, and then a lot of our traffic uh, as a brewery was from uh, the local uh, st stuff to do. So the CNO Canal, uh, the Potomac River, the Appalachian Trail, they all converge in Brunswick, um, which is a really unique part of the town. Um, but it also brings people from all walks of life. So, you know, a lot of people that are from Brunswick, you know, they don't go out of their way to, to drink craft beer or they didn't when we opened in, in 2015. Um, and then we have a lot of people from all walks of life that, that happen to stop in because uh, it, we actually found out. So our sign on the side of the building is massive. Uh, and it's it works really well as a billboard if you're walking on the Appalachian Trail, which is awesome. Apparently, we got a lot of feedback of people saying like, oh, we just saw you guys from the trail and we had to had to had to try you guys. Um, and it actually worked out in a bad way for us because people on the street couldn't read what we were and they thought we were like a closed down factory. So we had to end up putting like a smaller sign above the door and we put a, an open flag so people didn't think we we're, you know, a closed down uh, volunteer fire company. But yeah, so yeah, so so really, you know, all of the experiences um, from from meeting new people and stuff, we'd always have like, oh, I wish you guys had blank on tap oh i wish you guys you know would, would would have had a blank on tap and so every time we hear that you know our ears would perk so we started out with two kegerators which each one of those had six taps on it so we started out with uh with basically the capacity to have 12 which like you said that's kind of that's that's what most people stop anyways as the higher range um but then every single time Greg would would come off with a with a one off that was supposed to be just a seasonal one batch whatever it was it would gain a small cult following and then so we would have to turn that one off to one of our our staples and maybe not year long but like most of them are, are here for nine months at a time and so that's how we, we grew from twelve taps to twenty four pretty quickly. I uh, I very much enjoy the Patsy I'm enjoying it right now um, and just to tell a little personal tidbit tied to your bowling alley table story. Uh, yeah. I bowl in a league here in Frederick uh, up until this season because I'm not bowling during COVID, but um, right. bowling alley carries Patsy. So I would enjoy oh, awesome. ones of those every time I'd be at the bowling alley. Yeah. Yeah. No, we actually, um, when they first bought, they bought their first keg of the Patsy, we actually went down there to celebrate. So we had a little, a little team bowling uh, trip down there. There you go. But yeah. Um, so um, just, Back to the Patsy itself. Um, obviously, we named it for our arguably most famous guest to, to ever perform upstairs. Um, and I always say it's it's pretty lucky that we ended up coming out with with Greg, Greg picked an amazing recipe to start off, and you know there was no real tweaking it. The Patsy was it, and luckily for us, like you know, it would have it would have sucked to uh, name a, a one-off beer such a, a, a cool name and a cool backstory. But we were really lucky because uh, the Patsy um, is, is here to stay for good. I think that you have a really great recipe in this beer. Uh, I also like that you're calling it a hazy IPA and not a New England IPA because of the marks that it meets aromatically and on the palate. Like the amount of bitterness is so perfect for like a great American IPA that right. you're killing it. It's it's a wonderful beer. Thank you. Is there any rye in this? I know you guys do Maryland rye, Maryland. Is there any rye malt in the Patsy? I, I do not. I don't think so. Okay. I think it, it's got a little hint of like a spice note that may be hop driven, but it's really, really nice. Yeah. Uh, Christian from Frank about beer. So Berlin Brown is his favorite. So yeah. he was very happy that was awesome. the Perfect. Christian, I'm going to get yeah, you on um, these shows to be a co-host. Oh, he would love that. Um, so what's the next beer that you'd like everybody to, uh, learn about? Yeah. So the, uh, the next beer up is, uh, my best girl. That is our 
Hazy Double IPA. So this is our second newest release, actually. Um, we just released it uh, beginning of September. Um, and this is one of the ones that, uh, it was kind of like the Patsy where we're like, this is this is the first truly double hazy double IPA that we've ever made. Um, and so we were like, you know, we knew, we knew it was going to taste pretty good just because Greg never lets us down. Uh, but the first time we tried it, carbonated out of the fermenter, we were like, oh, this, this is something special. Um, and we were actually nominated for um, the Frederick News Post's Best of the Best. Um, somebody nominated My Best Girl as, as one of the best craft beers in, in Frederick City. So That's awesome. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, I was just going to say, I was sharing the description in the comments of each of these beers so people can refer there for specific hop additions and things like that. But, uh, looks like this has got a, a pretty good one-two punch of Amarillo and Simcoe in it. Yes. Yep. So a lot of flavors associated with that. Um, um, it's, it's, it's very, uh, fruity. It's not too heavy. Um, honestly, you know, it, it's one of those ones that will sneak up on you because for a, a double, uh, IPA, you know, you, you, you really, it goes down too smooth. <laughs> those are, uh, those are the kinds of beers that get either a, a love or a hate relationship from some people. Um, yeah. the idea that like, if you have this big, wet, juicy hop flavor hiding in the alcohol, Maybe a little surprised when they uh, stand up to go order yeah. the next one. <laughs> yeah, that's why we, we definitely warn people. And and so we with the twenty four beers, we, we actually organize them into to, uh, three tracks. Um, and track is synonymous for both the railroad tracks in Brunswick, and then also tracks like on a, on a mixtape or a, um, on an EP, because uh, all of us here at Smoketown are really into. Uh, uh, music. So we organized our, our whole beer menu on purpose uh, so that it, it's kind of decoded for you. Um, and track threes are all of our over eight percenters. Um, so we're always we're always sure to, to highlight all, all, that they're higher alcohol for people uh, so that they don't have too nasty of a surprise when they get to try to stand up. Sorry, I disappeared for a minute. I wanted to grab a can and uh, show it for folks. The can art is great on this one too. Yeah. What's the inspiration? Yeah, so um it's actually so my best girl is um a title of a Lucero song, which is Greg's favorite band. Um and so each one of our each one of our beers and each one of our cans tell a story. Um and so all of the core beers, they're tied to the history of Brunswick. Uh we model those cans so that when you look at them, you know what style it is because personally for all of us going into to designing cans, we said that our biggest qualm in going to a liquor store is for the most part, you know what you're in the mood for, what you're looking for, but it is a pain in the butt sometimes to find what kind of style a beer is. So you'll see it with all of our graphic designs, especially Potomac IPA, where the first thing you see is just IPA plastered on the bottom half of the can. Um, and so all of those were kind of designed off, off the idea that you're looking for a style, you want something that's good, traditional, it's gonna hit the spot, and we don't let you waste any time trying to figure out what kind of style it is. Whereas our seasonal one-off more beers that we like to have fun with, like the My Best Girl, we design all of those with, with the idea of like, we want to make it pop on the shelf so that you pick that up and just to say, what is this, you know? Um, and so I think they did a really great job of that, especially with My Best Girl. It's a beautiful can. It's interesting how many brewers in the state are big fans of Lucero. Zach, yeah, I know. It's <laughs> one of his favorite bands too, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it was actually funny because that, that uh, can got posted on the Lucero fan page and it blew up out of nowhere. <laughs> Uh, what a good time. It's great to see this connection, especially with you guys. You're, you're one of these breweries that is uh, truly embracing this connection of the creative aspects and art of music and the creative aspect and art of beer. Um, and it's one of the things in my past life in the, brewer, in the brewing industry that I really like to try to tie a lot of my can descriptions and, and beer descriptions to this idea that the experience that you have when coming to a beer and approaching a beer 
is similar to that that you have every time you're seeing a band perform live music because yeah. the environment the, the time of day, whatever it is, is going to change your perception and your experience. And you're going to be able to recall those things when they stand out. Exactly. And and for for Greg and I, especially, we, we both have um, a really warm place in our hearts for music. Um, so music means a lot to us, which is why, especially when we opened Creekside, we put a big fat stage here because we were like, you know, we at any stage that, uh, that, that, um, let local artists have to play in Frederick, you know, the more the better. Um, and so yeah, it, we, it really, to us, craft beer and music, like you said, very, very same idea for us. Um, and so we love the ability and we love the power to, to just be able to connect with you for, for us and for everyone that enjoys us. That's awesome. Um, I'm looking at our list and it looks like the next one we have up is uh, totally appropriate beer for the, uh, for the yes. time of year, huh? Yeah, so uh, next up is our, uh, Pauline Pumpkin Ale. Um, so this is our newest release here. Uh, we just dropped it last Friday. Um, and I will say, if you haven't had it yet and you are interested in it, please come soon because we are almost out of it already. Um, it's been that popular. So this one is one of my favorite stories of, of, of the uh, seasonals that we have. So it's named Pauline's Pumpkin Ale. Um, it's named after uh, Greg's uh, grandma because she had a Frederick Fair Blue Ribbon award-winning pumpkin pie recipe, and she would bake it every year for the fair. She'd bake half a dozen for the whole family, um, and every year it would be gone within a couple days. So when she passed away, his family they all you know they got the recipe and they tried to replicate it, but nobody could could do it quite the same way same way as Granny. So kind of was was not touched it was kind of um revered and nobody was like we, if we can't do it like she can no, you know we're not even gonna try so greg in his expertise in brewing said hey what if i turn her award-winning pumpkin pie recipe into a beer recipe so he scale it up for beer um and you can actually really taste it when you try it um to me i i, I only could describe it as as liquid pumpkin pie um you know, unlike a lot of other pumpkin beers, it's not just the spices associated with, with pumpkin. It's not just all spice cinnamon. Um, it really is a pumpkin pie recipe. So it really, we, we actually use real pumpkin um, and you can really taste it when you try it. It's very delicious. Your malt, uh, your malt bill here gives us a true like crust characteristic. Exactly. Awesome. And you get like that cooked pumpkin uh, like that caramelization note. That's that's really really pleasant. Yeah, no, it's it, it, it really takes you for a trip because you know the first the first taste that you taste when it hits your uh, um, your taste buds is obviously the spices, the, the strong flavors, and then right in the middle for me, I always taste that like you said that pie crust from the malt the malt bill, and then the the very end the aftertaste it just leaves you with like fresh pumpkin. Um, in your mouth so it's it's one of our most popular if you're a fan of pumpkin beers i know not everybody is but if you are definitely come and try it while we have it in uh, in stock it's, it's it's one of our best well i am not a fan of pumpkin beers and i'm not saying this to blow smoke get it <laughs> but uh it's yeah. a really really good beer thank you yeah I, I i'm actually the same way whereas like most pumpkin beers i'm not a fan of and I, and I think it's just because they're they're pumpkin in the fact that they're heavily spiced, which I'm not a fan of. Um, but this one is is really uh, you know it's one of my favorite beers for not liking pumpkin beers. Yeah, texture is great. The color of this beer is phenomenal. Uh, yeah, just just really nice, really rich, and uh, totally appropriate for this time of year. Exactly. Yep. It's so in your lineup of uh, seasonal, since we're talking about a seasonal release here, what do you guys tend to put out throughout the calendar year that's going to kind of fill out what your seasonal releases look like? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're fairly predictable when it comes to, uh, you know, we're, we're in a lot of cans and a lot of liquor stores, so we try to follow somewhat the, the trend of people um, and, and what they like to drink. Um, usually for summers, uh, the, what we do is a lot of our, our sours and, and tart ales. Um, and then something that's fairly new for us, uh, but that is, has been a huge success is, is our cider and expanding our, our, our cider menu. So 
being where we are, anyone that's that's not familiar with Frederick, our Creekside location here in Frederick is literally across the street. If you if you turn right while you're inside here and look out a window, um, it's the legendary McCutcheon's Apple Products factory. So um, McCutcheon's is super famous in Frederick, and, and really, like if you're from Maryland, you've probably had a McCutcheon's product, whether you know it or not. Um, and so, really, we're super lucky with an unlimited source of apple juice right across the street from us. Um, so, you know, in moving here, we just, we'll take our forklift, we'll, we'll take a tote over there, fill it up, um, and you really can't get more uh, fresh from the, the farm than that. Um, and so, a lot of our, our spring and summer stuff um, has now uh, gone to, to a couple of uh, spots on the tap for ciders as well, um, which our, our Cran Apple Crush Cider actually has become one of our top five um, drafts, and we actually put it in a can as well. Um, so that that was really exciting for us. Um, yeah, and then uh, moving on to the fall, um, you know, one of our fall staples, uh, I always think of it as, as the, the rye IPA. Um, so that's when we start going into slightly maltier flavor profiles. Um, but for fall, I like I like to um, keep it a little bit lighter, um, but with the, those maltier flavor profiles. So, like I said, we do the rye. Um, um, our our brown ale is now being re-released um, this fall. Right now, this this month, um, that one's a perfect beer because. I always tell people that's like it's like the kiddie pool for darker beers. Anyone that says like, "Oh, I'm not a fan of dark beers," I'm like, "Well, try this one because it's not what you think. You know, it's not heavy. It's not super um, offensive in, in strong flavors of coffee or chocolate or anything like that. It's very mild, caramel. You know, um, and in the body, it's pretty thin and it's, it's super approachable." So I always actually uh, convince people that they like darker beers more than they think when they when they try it. Um, and then obviously, one of Gre Greg's uh, best and favorite things to make is darker beers and stouts. Um, so really, late fall and winter is when we shell out all of the the great uh, barrel aged stuff, which you can see right here. We have quite a few barrels that we use for aging. Um, we have our black IPA, which that was supposed to be a seasonal and has become a core because it's so popular. That was actually Greg's first um, original recipe with us, and he blew it out of the park. Um, and then, yeah, so when we, when we start moving to, to spring, some of the stuff that we did like last spring was um, we did a lot of some wine barrel aging um, and some, some more fruitier, lighter flavors. Um, compared to the darker, maltier stuff um, that go well with wine. So for us, we did our Saison, um, which that will be back um, this, this fall. Um, and we did uh, a wee heavy, so that's a little bit maltier, but it was actually really delicious with red wine. It was a very good compliment. Um, and then our Belgian triple, stuff like that. All right, and uh, speaking of the barrels that you're pointing at, I know our last beer is going to be a, a barrel age phenomenon. Uh, I'm actually yeah. saving that one for after this call because it's a little heavy for me to sip on and then go pick my daughter up from daycare. But I promise you I'm going to enjoy it tonight, and I will send you pictures of me getting rowdy by the fire or something. Um, uh, yeah. What I would really like you to do is – I heard a rumor that there's some really creepy ghost story involved with your business. Yeah. And if you could tell us that story before we talk about this beer, that would be great. Yeah, I know. It's a, so it's really funny. Um, so I'll tell you, I'll tell you it from my point of view and then, you know, my very first interaction and then, and then you know, the overall history. So it was actually our very first day open in Brunswick. Um, I just worked, we just worked 14 hours, you know, it was opening day. We, you know, we had six people on here um, and we were slammed, super tired. We were really excited because it was, we just closed our, our very first at night open. Um, so, you know, we, we had just been hanging around a little bit and most of the staff, you know, trickled out. Um, so it was really just my family left. Um, and that was when my dad said, hey, can you uh, go upstairs and turn the lights off? Um, cause the master, the master building control for all the outside lights and stuff was, was upstairs in the event space. So I walk up there and I open up the, the electrical panel and I switch it off 
And as soon as I switch it off, I see a figure of a man standing like he has a board nailed to his back straight up, like right next to me in the doorway. And it was kind of one of those things where I was like frozen with fear and shock. And I kind of like slapped myself. He was gone. I was like, okay, well, you know what? I just worked like 14 hours. I'm really tired. Like, I just need some sleep. So I just tried to brush it off. I walked downstairs and my dad looks at me and he's like, looks like you've seen a ghost. And I was like, uh, funny you mention it. And he like stops, looks at me dead in the eyes and just says, oh yeah, you saw Walter. And I was like, whoa, what? Please, can somebody tell me, can somebody, somebody explain? Um, so subsequently I found out um, about Walter and his story. So Walter was the building engineer. So he was the guy that, that did all the work on the firefighting, uh, on the fire trucks. Um, so he wasn't a firefighter himself, but he was actually the only full-time resident of the building. So he was the only guy that had a permanent room because since it was a volunteer uh, fire department, uh, they had bunks and stuff, but he was the only one that lived there 24 seven. Um, so he was there from 1948 when the building was built to, uh, I believe he passed away in 1962. Um, and a little bit of a uh, uh, interesting fact about that is he actually passed away in his room in the fire hall. Um, so that was something that we, you know, we didn't know about going in, but um, I, I get this, this outpouring of stories and, and it's really, it's really interesting. Anyone that spent a significant amount of time in that building, whether it's firefighters, when it was a fire department, or, you know, even if a lot of, most of our employees, um, everybody has a Walter story. Um, and one of the most creepy actually was, um, we were painting the door to his room, which is in the, it's in the front house of the tap room. Um, and we, we just use it for storage now and stuff. Nobody um, really goes in there. Um, but we had painted it red because, you know, red and black is, is our color scheme. So we were painting it red. And the next day we walk in and it looked like somebody had smeared paint. It, it didn't dry right. It looked weird and it was splotchy. We're like, that was weird. I, I wonder if that was just, you know, moisture or whatever. Um, so we painted again after the doors closed. Same thing. This time it looked like fingers. So we're like, somebody's kid just put their, you know, just hand through our red paint. So we're like, all right, this time we're gonna do it when we're all the doors are locked. Nobody's in. Nobody's messing with this. It'll dry overnight. Same thing the next day, and this time it really looked like, and it it, it looks like a, a horror movie almost. So just drag it on. And if you want to see it, there's actually a picture on our on our Instagram, um, along with with uh, this story of Walter but um yeah so anyone that's worked there has, has had a story of Walter uh but my dabbers and they're not guys that mess around and you know believe in, in a lot of uh, mumbo jumbo like these are big big serious firefighters and they're telling you stories of Walter and you know they mean it you know everybody's everybody's seen Walter and has a Walter story um but the good thing is the happy end to the story is um we actually had somebody approach us who uh, was a uh, uh, a ghost um, a, a ghost inspect I don't, <laughs> um, I don't know what you'd call it paranormal investigator. That's the official. Uh, so we had a, a somebody that was a paranormal investigator in their spare time, and um, he came in and he did this really interesting thing where he took a flashlight. And he set it on on the, the table upstairs, and we were asking, we asked him no questions, and it was absolutely insane because he was answering, he was turning off and on the flashlight. Um, Are you kidding? He, what? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. We actually have a video, um, and yeah, it's absolutely wild. I was like, and he, and he showed me. It's just an Amazon light. Like, there's no tricks to it. There's no remote. Um, and so we were just asking him yes or no questions. And the last question we asked, like, all right, Walter, um, are you happy that this place is a brewery now? And we're like, oh. we all sit there with bated breath. We're like, oh, man. if he answers no, we're going to have to move out. Like, oh. And like, it, it turned on as bright as possible, which was the answer for yes. So we're like, Whew, okay, you know, 
I think I think Walter has an appreciation for uh, for what we we did the building and, and highlighting the history and stuff like that. So, yeah. So, uh, long story short, um, our first uh, bourbon barrel aged stuff. We tried to make a, a, a play off of you know spirits and ghosts. So we named our first uh, bourbon barrel Porter Walter Spirit. Um, and again, that's been one of our staples. Uh, we try to have this on tap all the time. Um, it's also one of my favorite beers that we've ever made. Um, you taste it, it's got all of the, the, the great notes of bourbon, super clean, um, super smooth finish, um, just super enjoyable. Um, yeah, it's delicious beer. Well, thank you for the good story. I think that you've just set a, uh, a very high bar for any uh, brewery following you this month to <laughs> come up with their best ghost story. Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyone that visits the tap room, especially in Brunswick, most of our employees both work both places, but um, I urge you, if, if you come by for a beer or for a plate, to uh, ask our staff about Walter. Because, um, like I said, many of them have had their own personal experience. So, there are tons of stories to hear about Walter. Um, do you have any guests that have told you that they've noticed anything while they're there? Yes. Uh, this this is something that actually sent chills down my spine. Uh, and I'm, I'm normally a, a hard person to scare, but um, so it was actually a, um, a co-worker of one of our employees. So there, a lot of our employees are teachers. Um, and so it was actually just a fellow teacher. So um, they were visiting probably their second time ever at the brewery. And he was waiting to order and we saw him back there and we could see him. He's a tall guy. He's like six foot two, six foot three. It, he turned around like something had just tapped him on the shoulder and there's nobody there, of course. Like, but it was a, such a visceral reaction that I was like, so whoever was working the bar was like, hey, what was, what was that about? He's like, I swear I felt somebody like tap on my shoulder and like say something and when i heard this i wasn't there so when i heard this i was like you know let's look back and so we actually looked back on the the building footage and you can see it happen totally unprompted he's like two feet away from anybody this tall guy just sit there and just like just jump and be like what, what was that um and he said he really felt somebody just grab his shoulder so Yes, lots of stories. A lot of a lot of customers have said something, and the coolest part is when when customers say something and they have no idea about Walter. You know, they haven't even made it to get a menu, and they're like, "Hey, I saw somebody. You know, I saw I saw this old guy walk in the back room. Like, I don't know if he's allowed to be here. I don't I don't know where he went. Like, um, yeah, that's Walter. That's crazy. All right, so if you're a ghost hunting aficionado or some kind of enthusiast, and you also like craft beer, the place that you should be visiting this time of year is the Smoketown Brewing Station in yes. Brunswick, for sure. Yes. Have you guys had any weird experiences at the Creekside location? I imagine, uh, you know, it, we have. We actually have. <laughs> so I don't like talking about it because I don't want to. Um, we don't. I don't have any confirmed uh, cool history like Walter. Um, you know, and I don't want to think that I'm going crazy, but actually the first, uh, first couple months that we were open here, um, we, me and Greg, we both had an experience with somebody yelling when we, it, you know, it was nine in the morning. So nobody was there. Somebody shouting, um, we've had door slam and nobody's around. There's no draft stuff like that. We were like, uh, is Walter following us? I don't know. Sure. Was we, we, we we call it, uh, Did you guys a heart attack? Yeah, we uh, we jokingly call it maybe it's the bride of Walter. Oh, there you go. Um, so for Walter Spirit, the bourbon barrel porter, what kind of barrels are you guys aging that in? Um, so they're uh, A. Smith Bowman. So uh, they're fairly local. They're in uh, Sterling, Virginia. Um, so when we, we first came out with the idea to do bourbon barrel aged stuff, uh, we wanted it to, to have a local place. Um, so, yeah, they're about an hour away from us, even closer in, in, at our, from our Brunswick location. Um, so we've done very different variations, but for the most part, the, the Walter spirit that you have over the tap has been aged from anywhere between uh, four to six months. Um, and then we've done a few that were super special. Um, last year for, for Christmas, we actually released uh, a two-year-old aged uh, Walter spirit um, in bottles, which is, which is 
Yeah, no, we we actually uh, we thought it might be Brian, but he wasn't even around that day. So, <laughs> yeah, so we we've done different versions of Walters. Um, we've also done a few, uh, you know, stouts and stuff uh, in 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 bourbon barrels, and then oh, uh, well, we actually I will plug this this really exciting uh, beer that we're releasing um, is we have we have um, Maker's Mark barrel that we are going to do a special uh, special batch of. Um, so that's going to be available in bottles at uh, Riverside Liquors uh, here in Frederick as well as here. So we're, that was a, a collab. They they snagged the barrel for us and let us know. So um, we're really excited to see how that one turns out too. Very cool. It's great when you can build those retail relationships where they want to like give you access to something yeah. that, that a distributor or a wholesaler or supplier is going to hand to them and, and really build a collaboration yeah. out of it. Right. Yeah, we're not for as much as we deal in barrels, you know, we don't come across fresh dumped makers mark barrels too often. So um, we're always super appreciative when somebody sees that kind of stuff and thinks of us and wants to do something with us. Very cool. So the availability of Walter Spirit right now is draft, obviously, growlers and crowlers also for guests that are coming in. Yeah, so we actually don't do that one in growlers. Okay. It's less than half percent. And I mean, it, it has such a following that uh, if we did growler fills, I think we'd run out of it much quicker. Um, so yeah, so that one is available in uh, crowlers, and then we also do the the uh, Belgian bomber bottles as well. Oh, very cool. So you've got that in. Is that twenty two ounce? Yeah. Very cool. Well, that's awesome. Uh, Christian is very excited about the Maker's Mark rendition. Uh, we will. Yeah. We will wait for the post when he gets his, uh, because I'm sure he will make a big deal about it. Awesome. Uh, so what else do you want people to know about Smoketown? We've got about five minutes left. Uh, our timing's impeccable. This has been one hell of a happy hour. You told us a ghost story. Yeah. We've heard all about great beer. Um, yeah, so uh, I will say um, that please come check us out at either location. Um, like you said at the beginning of uh, – when you're introducing everything uh, we are open fully open both places um brunswick we have huge patio seating um uh you know in a beautiful view in frederick we have patio and indoor seating um we also do uh, carry out and delivery uh to all frederick county as well um through beer me so um and if you're not from frederick county you can always order pickup and and, and take it home with you as well uh, yeah, so please come visit us, especially while the weather is beautiful like this. Uh, you really can't beat it, um, especially for being a, a city brewery in Brunswick. Um, you really can't can't beat the uh, the ambiance and the view from there. If you're looking for ways to stay safe and uh, be able to enjoy a little bit of the outdoors during uh, this early fall season, the Brunswick location is great. It's right off the CNO Canal path. You can go and take a nice walk there. You're right off the AT, just like uh, Dave said, or I'm sorry, Jake said earlier. Calling you by your dad's name. Sorry about that. Or it happens all the time. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and then, opportunity to enjoy the outdoors while you're enjoying these great beers. So make a day out of it, see what they've got going on, and go visit their locations. Yeah, exactly. We really, we really can't beat it in Frederick, like like we talked about. Uh, we have our own mini brewery tour right here. Um, you park in one place and you can hit all four of our breweries with the, with the stone. Um, and in Brunswick, we have these two beautiful garage doors. Um, so those are always open, tons of ventilation, tons of space out there. Um, so we really do hope you guys visit. Well, do me a favor if you're watching right now, give uh, Smoketown Brewing a follow on their Creekside and Smoketown Brewing Station accounts, both on Instagram and Facebook. They've got tons of great information for you. Check them out at uh, Brewing.com for a full list of their uh, beers on draft and descriptions of those beers. And please show your support for Maryland breweries this weekend while staying safe and enjoying yourselves. Visit us at MarylandBeer.org for updates about the industry. And uh, if you have any questions about what we're up to, check our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, follow us and subscribe on YouTube. Thank you all for a wonderful Friday afternoon. Jake, thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. And Appreciate it. Check in with you all next week. We have uh, Calvert Brewing Company coming on with us. That's going to be great. I was there today taking some photographs for a fun project. I think we'll be ready to announce next week and uh, looking forward to it. Awesome.